Good evening and welcome to Tuesday Folk People. My name is Maddie Leedham and tonight we are bringing to you an artist whose innovative approach to folk has led her to be named number four in The Guardian's 10 Best Folk Albums and named in the Folk Radio UK Best 100 Albums of 2020. Hailing from County Down in Northern Ireland, this artist has pioneered her own sound, aptly named Cosmic Folk. With the use of both acoustic and electric instruments, this artist puts her own twist on traditional folk songs, as well as writing her own nature-inspired originals. With her music being broadcast on national and international radio, this artist garners high praise wherever she goes. For example, The Guardian critic Jude Rogers says this about the album The Man in the Mountain. You're put in the place of a bird navigating wide open landscapes, absorbing light, space and air. This is music that takes you on its wing and gives you fresh visions. So with that, it brings me great pleasure to welcome the wonderful Brona McVitty to our online studio. Welcome, Brona. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Maddie. No worries. Are you in County Downs at the moment? I am in County Down, yes. I'm at my mum's house, actually. Um, I'm in Rathfor Island at the moment. And this is her art on the wall behind me. Our um, audience are going to be very excited about you because you are a very critically acclaimed performer. You've, you've released two albums that have had rave reviews, have had descriptions from The Guardian, you know, it's been on Mark Radcliffe's BBC Radio 2 show. It's been it's been all over the place. So we're really, really lucky to have you on home stage today. Um, and I think that our audience would probably love to hear your your songs, seeing as they're so they're so wonderful, as we can see by the reviews. Um, and our first one is The Lark in the Clear Air. Before we hear it, can you tell us a bit about it? This is a traditional folk song. Um, it was composed by a guy called Samuel Ferguson, who was from Belfast. And he wrote this song in the 1850s. Um, and it's a song I've been singing for many years. Um, and I was very honored to have a Norwegian composer, Arve Henriksen, record with me uh, he arranged the music for the album version um, and this version is me performing um, at a place in County Down it's called Spelga Reservoir and um, you can see the water in the background and also it was very windy and it was actually slightly raining on me when we did this recording so you'll hear the harp humming and that's actually that's like the wind is playing the harp so Thank you. 
absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much, Brona. It was really, no the word that I would describe it is ethereal. Genuinely, I feel like your voice and the harp make me feel like a skylark is is singing. I don't know if that was a conscious decision, but it, it did really feel like that. Well, that particular location, Spelga Reservoir, is actually where you will hear skylarks um, singing. And because there are no trees, it's a very wide open expanse. And so the sound of the birds singing there is something very special, which was why I wanted to perform the song at that location. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, the, this whole nature thing, that's quite a prominent feature in your music, isn't it? Um, but why why are you so in tune with nature? Well, for me, nature is really, I think, the only way that we could possibly understand what some people might describe as God. Um you know, it's it's great mystery has been unraveled to some extent by science, but there's still a lot that we don't understand. And there's almost, I think, a spiritual experience when you when you're out in nature and when you experience nature, and it's very moving. And I find on many occasions that it moves me to to write. Um, so it's just really as a consequence of the fact that I'm, I'm so in awe of it. Uh, it's constantly inspiring, and um, yeah. <laughs> and you come from a bit of a, a scientific background, don't you? You did a degree in biology. Um, do you find that that helps when you are interpreting nature in your songs? Uh, I think I have a tendency to probably look at things maybe slightly differently because of my understanding of molecular biology. Um, I mean, for example, the process of photosynthesis, um, you know, where plants create sugar essentially from sunlight. Um, it's really quite an amazing thing. And knowing a little bit more about it, I suppose you do look at things differently. Um, but I particularly like uh, wildflowers and botany as well. So I think I'm quite inspired by by botany in my in my songwriting. Fantastic. And when you were doing these recordings for us in in nature, do you find that that gives you a better experience actually performing your music in the setting that they may have been based or inspired by? Actually, it's quite strange performing outdoors. Um, the technical setup is it, it's quite demanding. It takes us. Um, so I'm working with my partner, who's a sound engineer, and he's manning the the live recording. Um, he's literally, you know, setting up the camera and making sure the sound card's doing what it's supposed to do, so that we can get a good take. And it takes about an hour and a half to set up. And you're very much at the mercy of the elements. So you're so distracted by all that. By the time you get around to doing the performance, um, you've kind of got a little bit cold. <laughs> and so it's not really the same as if you just take your instrument, like I sometimes do, just take my instrument outside and sit and play outside. And that really is fun. Um, but when you're recording, it's a whole a whole different ball game really um, but I should say as well that this project that I've been doing the outdoor recordings I've been doing um, it was something that I dreamed up during the pandemic and I felt rather than sitting on my sofa and live streaming from my sofa I wanted to go outdoors but I didn't have the right equipment and so I applied to the Arts Council of Northern Ireland and said, please, will you give me some money so that I can buy like decent camera lenses and things like that? Um, and also a portable uh, sound card so that I could use that with my laptop. So they very kindly said yes. And so um, I think I need to acknowledge their generosity um, by mentioning them here in, in the interview. 
I think it was very much worth their while though with the with what's been produced it wasn't a waste of 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 loaning you these things because they're oh. it's just fantastic and um I think that we should hear our second song just to do them a bit more justice so we've got the man in the mountain now this one you told me the story of this last time we spoke and it was fascinating and I was wondering if you could tell our audience how this song came about yes yeah, so um this is uh inspired by a, a folk legend from County Down from where I'm from um and if you are standing on the shore in the village of Rostrever and you look across the loch you can see um some mountains and um, they're called the Cooley Hills and there's one in particular Sleeve Foy and where you can actually see the profile of a sleeping giant um in the mountainside and every kid that grows up in Rostrevard knows this story, the story of Finn McCool and how after this epic battle with the Scottish giant, he lay down to rest and he's still, he's still there. Um, and so the story goes that Finn was rumbled by the Scottish giant after having a big feed of wild boar and the Scottish giant came along and Finn was like, what are you doing here? And they end up having this massive fight. And so they fight with their fists and then they fight with clubs. And then on the third day, they start hurling these huge boulders at each other. And so Finn throws a boulder from the Cooley Hills, which are in the Republic of Ireland, over to the Bourne Mountains, which are on the northern side, Rostrever, where, where I'm standing. And the rock is still sitting on top of the mountain um, where it slayed the Scottish giant um, and it's now a tourist attraction so everybody comes there and climbs the thousand feet up sleeve mean to see the Clockmore Stone as it's now called. Um, so that's the story really and I'm attempting to tell the story um, in the song although I realise that for people who haven't or don't know the story it, I'm not sure you know, it, it might seem a bit weird. <laughs> Mother, I saw my lion over there, there where the mountain meets the sky. Is he sleeping or is he dead? He lay down a very long time ago After three days fighting with rocks and with his bare hands They said he was the giant of the summer time In the 
and he killed the giant with the clock more stone. The man in the mountain. The man in the mountain. The man. Well, that was absolutely fantastic. Quite a different vibe to your first one. I feel like the first one was very, as I said, ethereal. This one kind of felt not jazzy, but it had a bit more of like a, I don't know, I don't know the word for it. It reminded me a bit of the cranberries. I don't know if that's if that's a compliment for you. I mean, it is for me. I love the cranberries. So it felt quite oh, cool in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But um, obviously you were inspired by folklore for that one. And do you find that a lot of your songs and things are inspired by the folk tradition and folklore as it for hundreds of years? Definitely. Um, yes, I was... Uh, lead singer and harpist in a traditional um, Irish folk band in London called the London Lasses um, and I was I sang with them for for a decade and I researched a lot of traditional Irish songs during that time because that was that's what they do um, and you know I got them to do like some Scottish stuff as well the odd Scottish one in there too um, so that was really a very traditional grounding for me. Um, and I love listening to uh, old archive recordings, you know, the likes of what Alan Lomax would have recorded in Ireland in the 1950s. And so all that sort of stuff I really love. But then at the same time, um, I also love pure electronic music as well. So um my my influences are are a bit all over the place but then I think that's often the way for for <laughs> artists and creative people these days they borrow little bits of things from here and there don't they um so because we're so mm. it, everything's got so global because of because of the internet so you know there's no there's no yeah. limit really to what what you can digest um apart from your own limits to how much you can digest I suppose well I was gonna I was gonna talk about that next about how obviously you have this this grounding in tradition but you've got such uh, an innovative and almost futuristic sound towards folk with your especially your your latest album the man in the mountain um and so I was I wanted to know how you've managed to go about blending your two loves of electronica and folk into this unique sound that I think people are calling folktronica from what I, I could read. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I would say that it's not really a difficult thing. Um, it just for me, I want to give the songs new clothes. Um, and I love acoustic versions. And actually, these recordings I've been doing in the wild, those are very acoustic compared to what I've done in the studio. So there's a real contrast there if you compare the live versions with just me, you know, by myself and then versus me with however many other musicians I've roped into recording um, in, in the studio environment. So it's very different. I think that there's such a kind of rich palette available to artists now that are creating the software is readily available um and there's just so many things you can do with the software i mean i use ableton live for example which is it's like a dj's tool and you can really really do some weird and wacky stuff um in that software and i've really only scratched the surface and i'm i'm looking forward to doing more experiments for album number three um but yeah it's just a I like experimenting that that's just it really especially with different sonic palettes um so yeah mm. 
And do you find that by blending these two genres that you're bringing new fans to folk? So not just the traditional folkies, but people from other genres are beginning to get a bit interested in our genre. I am not sure how many of my followers, supporters, are traditional folkies. I know certainly some of them are because having performed with the London Lasses for such a long time, I was known within the traditional circles. I'm not sure that all the traditional um, folkies, as you call them, I'm not sure that they necessarily approve, but certainly there's a there's a proportion of them that, <laughs> that definitely must do. Um, but then there are other people, I think, who who have been very supportive, bought CDs and bought my music. And I, th I don't think those people are necessarily specifically interested in folk. Um, although I couldn't really say with any great degree of accuracy. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh... <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I think that we should have your third song. Um, and then after, I'd like to talk a bit more about this, this fantastic, unique sound that you have. Um, but first, so we've got So Be It When I Grow Old. Can you tell us about this song before we hear it? Um, well, this is a very nostalgic song, um, largely inspired by a massive oak tree that is in the park across the road from where I'm currently living. Um, and the tree is hundreds of years old. Um, and in the song, the tree becomes a thousand years old. So there's a bit of artistic license in there. Um, but when you think about just how many generations of humans that that tree has been privy to in its lifetime, I think it sort of makes you think about time and how our lifespans are, are so, so short, you know, relative to, you know, the age of the tree. And then if you think about geological time again, you know, millions of years, uh, it's kind of hard to comprehend, isn't it? So, but the song's really, it's a, it's a nostalgic song harking back to uh, my childhood days of playing on the meadow where this tree lives.
I I really love that one. And I when I was listening, I could hear the beat in the background. And I was wondering, is that a Bodron that you're playing? No, it's actually uh, it's my little electronic beatbox. Um, so it's a it's like a synthesizer, oh. but it's for programming beats. So um, you can kind of set it up the tempo according to what suits your song and you can put a little program in you know of what kind of beats you want I usually go for something pretty simple but um that's really the only electronic component that is there in in that live rendition for example I do have a little synthesizer that I sometimes play but it's it's kind of hard to play the guitar and then play the synthesizer as well I need to get my toes involved so I can do some synth at the same time <laughs> Isn't it amazing that one person can make the sound of like a full band that used to require loads of people, but now you can be completely independent in your music making? Isn't it just fantastic? Band in a box, yeah, it's great. I guess it, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I guess that kind of massively opens up the opportunity to experimentalise, doesn't it? Uh, or experiment. <laughs> so do you find that, your whole music is a case of, I don't know what I'm going to do here. I'm just going to give it a go and just see what happens. And then you just, just experiment. Yeah, there's definitely, um, I think there has to be a really, really strong element of play uh, in order for you to retain the, 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 there has to be a feeling in the song that is something that someone else can relate to. And I often find that, you know, I'll get like a, a riff going or a loop or something. And I think, oh, I like that. So I'm playing it on whatever instrument. And then I just start singing over the top. And it's literally, it's just playing. And a lot of it ends up going in the bin. But some of it then you think, oh, actually... No, I, yeah, I think I like that. I'll come back to that. So it's it's a very kind of ad hoc kind of way of doing things. I don't have a a, a process, um, but I tend to get interested in particular things and then explore those things. And I suppose when you're working on an album, you'll have like, for example, I bought a theremin that I just absolutely had to have on the second album, even though a lot of people don't like the sound of the theremin. So, <laughs> but I had to get it in there, even though my co-producer was just like, mm, not really sure about this, but um, yeah, I like, I think you have to play and have fun. And if you're having fun, then the people that, that, that listen, hopefully are going to have fun as well. So. Yeah. No, I agree. Have you ever considered um, blending your two things of electronica and then this love of nature that surrounds you, like maybe using nature sounds in like the electronic way? I think you mentioned last time, um, who? what was his name? Um, Cosmo Matthew Sheldrake. You, you mentioned how oh, he yes. used... Yes. Yeah. 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 How, how he used the, the bird songs in his synthesizer. Have you considered doing something like that in your own work? Yes, definitely. I think that I have done some in the past. Um, I had a band, um, maybe, I don't know, it's like 10, no, it's more, it's like 15 years ago now I had a band and we very much did that. We, we sampled a lot of nature signs and, put all the signs into the songs and it was lovely. Like, and I definitely really like that. And I am playing a little bit with some bird song inspired stuff, um, which definitely Cosmo Sheldrake. I love what he did. I think it's really clever. Um, and also, you know, it ties in obviously with our whole kind of, increasing anxiety about the environment and you know what what can we do to better protect it um so mm. i think uh i'll definitely have some some nature signs in in the next album i promise you 
compliment. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love that. Um, so you you said that you've only touched the surface of electronica really with your music at the moment. For the third album, should we expect a little bit deeper into that world? Well, in the second album, I invited people I feel are expert in their field of experimental electronic music and for the third album I would like to still have some really interesting collaborations but I would also like to um, delve a little bit deeper myself and one of the things that I've been getting interested in during the lockdown um, doing courses on is uh, frequency modulation synthesis and just trying to understand exactly what that is so when people play a synthesizer you know what's actually happening inside the box so that I could start to sort of manipulate things and understand a little bit more about that process so I think there may be um, a little bit more sort of synth stuff going on um, in the next album. So for my final question, I want to ask whether you think that by adding this electronic side to the folk music, you are taking the folk music one step or, or further away from its roots. That's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, I suppose every generation that a song is sung again um it is further away from its roots, if you like. Um, I mean, for example, Eileen Aroon, which is a song that I collaborated with the electronic duo Isan um, to create a different version of. Um, that song I learned from the recordings from the Clancy Brothers um, from you know early 1970s recordings. And I mean, I love what they do. And, but I think that music, it, it is off its time. Um, whether that makes it further away from its roots or not, um, it's probably more for the listener to decide. Um, Brilliant. I mean, personally for me, I think it's brilliant that you're doing it. And I, I love that because I think that there is a lot of traditional music out there and any way to do what you said earlier, to put new clothes on the music and appeal to a wider audience, I think is brilliant. So personally, I think, great. So <laughs> thanks for doing it. Um, and Thank you. we have one final song from you today. Before we hear it, I do just want to say a huge, huge thank you from us at Home Stage for coming on along and talking to us about your brilliant music and for giving us these fantastic clips that I'm sure that our audience have absolutely loved if they're anything like me. So thank you so much, Bronna. Oh, thank you for having me, Maddie. It's been a pleasure. No worries. For the final song, we have The Green Man. Now, can you tell us about this one? Um, so I was sitting at my kitchen table one day looking out at the tree canopy. Um, I live beside a river and sometimes the trees get cut back in the river. But the last few years, the ash and the sycamore trees have been just growing up. So they're like 10 metres tall now. And um, a few years ago, there was the trees were intersecting in a particular way so that there was like I could see this head of this, like, just, I can only describe him as a green man. Um, and his head was like, the sycamore tree was, was, was his head. And the, there was an ash, two ash branches coming through and they were his arms. And it was just quite striking. This figure was suddenly there. Um, and I just got a piece of paper and I, I just had to write down what I could see. And so the lyrics for the song came from that, just me sitting at the kitchen table. There was no tune or anything. And then I was playing my harp later and just came up with this little pattern. And then I just started singing and I was like, oh yes, I could use those words. So I started to play around with the, the words I'd written down as lyrics. And that's where this song came from, The Green Man. 
very much for watching. To find out more information about our future Tuesday Folk People sessions, please sign up to our mailing list or keep an eye on our social media and website. Our next session will be a week from today at 8pm. See you then!